Hi, welcome to the Landscape Photography Show. We're going to have a great show for you tonight. We've got Dan Hughes, who is a, a processing guru, and he's going to talk to us about focus stacking. And he's got a lot of great information to share with us. And uh, we're uh, really excited for that. So um, I'm Kevin Rowe. I live in South Jordan, Utah. And uh, I'm a, a, a s amateur uh, photographer. I have another job, so I guess you call me amateur. And uh, I love to, uh, landscape photography is my passion. And uh, I also work with the landscape photography theme and the landscape photography community. And uh, over in California, we got Tom. Tom, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Tom Hurl, and I live in Carmel, California. Like Kevin, I'm also an amateur photographer. It's involved with both the um, landscape photography theme and community. And enjoy participating on this show. Um, Great. Is Margaret? Hi, everyone. I'm Margaret Tompkins, and I'm in Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, I'm uh, also an amateur photographer, but I'm retired, so I don't have a day job. <laughs> and uh, and enjoy uh, landscape photography uh, tremendously. And uh, I, too, work on both the uh, landscape photography theme and the landscape photography community. And I'm just really excited about tonight's show. Awesome. And Jim? Yeah, hi. I'm Jim Worthman, and uh, not to sound like a broken record, but I'm also an amateur enthusiast photographer uh, based in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, mostly I love shooting landscapes, uh, color in black and white, and also participating in the uh, landscape photography theme and community with uh, our other fine panelists. And likewise, Dan, good to have you back. Uh, looking forward to tonight's show. Awesome. And uh, Jim just got a new toy, so if you, everyone should stop by his stream and be jealous because he got a new a new camera. So, and so now what we're going to do is we're going to go to our show starters. And what these are is these are the photos that uh, people have submitted to our event. And then we go through and we choose one each to show as a full show starter. So let me go to those. Okay, and here's uh, the one that I chose, and this is Bill Caddy, and I just really liked the mood of this photo. Uh, great mood with the uh, fog, and you got a little bit of sunlight breaking in there, making for a nice orange glow, and the uh, dock is nice and sharp, so great job, Bill. And Jim. Okay, yeah, a lot of, lot of great interpretations of, of depth of field in the event. Um, my pick, and I'll apologize ahead of time, is uh, Jacob Kritmula. And I chose this for the strong, really sharp foreground, and you know, it holds detail most of the way down into the frame. Um, I, I love the colors, the composition, and, and the long exposure effect. Yeah, beautiful. Margaret. Uh, this is one uh, from Donna Fullerton. Uh, she shared several just awesome photographs with us. Uh, this one just really caught my eye. I, I love the, all the details in the foreground, uh, the brush there and the sand and all of that, and then the mountains and that wonderful kind of dramatic sky. I just enjoyed so many elements in this photograph. Just really caught my eye. Yeah, it's fantastic. All the uh, layers and the shadows, it's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, it's the balance of light and shadow that just really caught me. Definitely. And Tom? I, I chose this one from um, Daniel Ribeiro. Um, since the focus of this show is focusing and focus stacking, um, you often think of applying that to uh, macro photography and things like flowers. And My guess is um, he might have used focus stacking for this, but Obviously, it's, it's very crisp and sharp throughout throughout the picture. I mean, the, um, the f most of the flower and the petals and, and the leaves on the left are all, all very sharp. So I picked this as my show starter. All right, great. Whoa, and now I'm missing Dan's for some reason. Joe. Oh. Okay, let's see. Where did I put it? Okay. 
Hey, Jim, why don't you tell everyone what kind of camera you got while I find this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, and so I did a lot of looking for something smaller, and usually I carry around a Canon uh, 5D Mark II, and that's what you'll see in my stream mostly is photos from that. Occasionally an iPhone shot. It was kind of neat to be out on, on location and be able to take a quick iPhone shot and immediately share it to G+, so you'll see a couple of those, but... Um, I ended up with the Fuji um, X-T1, and uh, it's, a, it's a little bigger than the iPhone, but way smaller than the Canon, and uh, so far, so good. I'm real happy with it. Cool. Yeah, well, everyone will, will want to hear more about your experience with it. Oh, yeah. So, okay, here we go, Dan. This is the one you chose. Yeah, so I, it was uh, David Williams. Um, you know, I, I think it's just sort of use of light and and shadow that did it for me and and I think it's really the 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 sharpness on that left tree over there that or not even the sharpness but the detail itself and that striping light and it draws your eye back into the back uh, into the foreground and or into the, uh, the background itself it's uh, a beautiful shot well done yeah great beautiful okay so we'll get right over to Dan um, now Dan if you've never uh, been on while Dan was on. He's a he's pretty much a professional trainer. Um, that's what he did uh, for Google for a long time. Is he went and trained for the Nick software, and so he's really good at it. And so we're really excited to have him tonight. And uh, we'll turn it over to you, Dan. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate it. I uh, I haven't done a presentation like this in about a month and a half, and I've, it's actually taken me about that long to put this together uh, to a form that I really liked. So. Uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it as well. Um, a brief note, the shot that Donna, I, I think, Margaret, you had chosen Donna's shot, that's from the Mesquite Sand Dunes, um, and two of the photographs that I'll be demoing tonight are also from the Mesquite Sand Dunes. Uh, right. So it's kind of just funny. It's the same location, right, out of anywhere in the whole world. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my screen. I will mention that uh, I would completely 100% agree with the way Kevin put, um, I guess, what I do. And that is, uh, I, I don't necessarily get paid to make photographs professionally. I tend to get paid to do uh, demonstrations and to talk about photography and to do all the sort of research and legwork and then make it into something that's sort of, um, uh, well, in presentation form. So I count myself really lucky to be able to do that. Uh, it's a whole lot of fun. I get to go out and shoot and then, you know, basically talk to people about what I shot and how I did it. <laughs> and and then, you know, more so than that, do a lot of research as to, uh, you know, how, how they can do it and what it takes to do that stuff. Um, what here, or what we're here to talk about, and you guys can see my screen now, correct? Yep. Yeah. Okay. We're going to be talking about focus stacking for landscape photography. Uh, we'll get into or talk a little bit about... Uh, focus stacking for um, for macro photography. It's it's almost the same concept. There are a few little differences in terms of maybe the pieces of equipment that you might use for focus stacking with uh, with macro. Focus stacking for landscape, you can use basically your tripod and uh, you know any lens that you'd typically be shooting your landscape stuff with. Uh, macro, you can do that with macro lenses, but there's uh, there's other tools that make it, uh, I guess, easier, more precise to do macro focus stacking. We're going to focus on um, landscape stuff this evening. Now, for anyone who's not familiar with focus stacking, uh, we're basically capturing multiple exposures of the exact same scene, but we're changing the focus point. So, and, and where this works really well is if you have um, a composition with a really strong foreground element, something in the, in the, you know, in the front of the shot, like this image right here. Um, it, hopefully if it works again. There we go. So you'll see when we zoom out, there's this thing in the front of the image, right? And it's tack sharp. But then all the way back to the, the, the background, that's tack sharp as well. And that can be achieved uh, a couple different ways, uh, but... Uh, the way we're going to do it here tonight is with focus stacking, and the benefit of, of this focus stacking, or the way that we're going to talk about it, is using the best resolving aperture that your lens has. Um, and that is, with the lens that I shot that previous photograph with, it was an f4 lens, 
and it uh, that means or generally means that two stops up up from f4, so at f8, uh, I'm going to have the highest resolving um, uh, detail basically from that lens. Now the problem that we're going to run into is that at f8. I don't or can't always get the full range of information, the, the sharpness, uh, depth of field, from one single shot. And you know that rings true, especially for a lens like a, a 2.8 lens, which is going to generally resolve best at about 5.6, um, and, and that's relatively limited in a depth of field, right? So you're you're not going to be able to get everything you want in focus um, at something like f4 in almost any photograph, unless you're shooting at hyperfocal distance, which is uh, a sort of different thing, and, and hyperfocal distance doesn't necessarily allow you to uh, have detail in the, the foreground, especially when you have you know, a, a foreground dominant or um, an image with, with a, a strong foreground element. Now, here we're just going to quickly run through all of the f-stops here with this lens, um, and, and not necessarily to talk about depth of field, although you can get a good feel for what's happening here. Um, I just want to show you as we run through. So here's f4, here's 5.6, here's f8. I'll give it a, a second or two in case anyone has any latency in their connection. Uh, but as we run through each one, you can see at f11, we've got far more sort of um, sharpness in the background. It's still out of focus. As we get up into something like F22 or F32, you know, and, and not even getting into the composition or, you know, the fact that the background becomes really distracting, technically we have more stuff in focus at F32. The problem is that at F32 uh, we will generally get, or even 22 and oftentimes even F16, uh, we'll, we'll get something that's called diffraction. Uh, and here this goes all the way up to F36. Um, and what diffraction does, in our intensive purposes anyways, is that we, we, we lose um, fine details and textures at something like F32. And I'll show you another example of that here. So here we've got a 100% zoom. We're at F4. And let me actually escape. I should have did something to, to sort of show you what I was focusing on. Apparently I'm blind because I was trying to focus on the very center here, but I didn't do a good job at that. Uh, so I focused right about here for this initial shot. So if you watch that detail in the next few frames, uh, you'll see what I'm getting at. This is F4. It's got good resolving at F4. Here's F8, where you can see, A, there's more stuff in focus, but then also my maximum sharpness is even better. So at F8, that's pretty darn good. And then if I go to F32, again, you'll have a, a relative sharpness of everything coming more in focus, but you don't get the same kind of resolution, the same detail as what we were getting at F8. But again, if you watch those details in that one little small spot, or even on the side of the flower towards the right, um, you know, off of that, uh, right around here, at F8, you're getting a lot more uh, sharpness, a lot more resolution uh, than at F32. So that's one thing to kind of keep in mind, and that's one way to really get the most out of your lenses, is to shoot at that uh, sort of optimal uh, aperture. Now, again, that said, it limits your depth of field, so what you have to do is shoot uh, a series of exposures and focus at the different points, the different distances, uh, starting in the foreground, well, you don't necessarily have to start in the foreground. You could start in the background and make your way forward. But what you want to do is make sure that you've captured the, the if you will, ultimate sharpness uh, at each portion of your exposure. Now, as I say that, the resulting photos that we get from these things um, are, are images that are tack sharp from the foreground all the way to the background. Oftentimes, that's not what you want to do, right? Oftentimes, we want a, a shorter depth of field, or we want to direct the viewer with a depth of field, or you know, with things being in focus and out of focus, because that's very important. Um, but then there's other other situations where we might want absolutely everything in focus. Um, hey, what comes? Yep, go ahead. Uh, just to interrupt, we got one question uh, in the chat. Uh, do you have any rule of thumb for how many photos uh, that you'd want to take to, to do focus stacking in this latter example? So you're going from fairly close to infinity. That's a, that's a fantastic question. 
and it's completely dependent upon the situation. That is, your, the lens that you're using, the aperture of that lens that you're using, the distance from the foreground you know, to the background, and the distance from the camera to the foreground. <laughs> uh, there are depth of field uh, calculators, though. And I'll, I'll give you guys a link. There's even an app on your phone. There's a, there's a bunch of apps that, that can give you um, you know, depth of field calculations. And what you then do is you say, okay, well, the thing that's important in my foreground is 10 feet away from me, or thereabouts. It doesn't have to be exact necessarily because you, you know, you'll see if it's in focus when you look on the back of your camera. Um, but you want to make sure that you get that foreground element tack sharp. And then as you make your way back, and this is where you kind of want to use those depth of field calculators. You want to make sure that everything is at some point in focus. And I'm going to show you in a couple minutes um, something that I ran into where I didn't shoot enough frames. And you'll get to see kind of um, you know, what happens when you don't shoot everything so that you've got the maximum detail. Uh, it's a great question, uh, but it's... It's a difficult one to answer because there's so many variables. Um, now, you know, two other sort of notes, if you will, is that we want to pay attention to the depth of field at a given distance, right? I mean, and these are sort of little notes. I, I guess we probably had enough time to read what's on the screen, so I won't even worry about it. Um, on this Nikkor lens on the right, there is a depth of field scale as well. So this is quite handy. Um, it's, it's not necessarily as handy now that we're shooting digitally because we can actually look at the screen and, and zoom right in uh, in most cases to see if we've got things in, in focus. But uh, what this is telling me here with f11 is that basically anything at 2 meters uh, to 1 meter is going to be in relative focus, right? So this is pretty good for depth of field at f11, and this is a wide lens. So uh, you're going to see you're going to have a, a, a relatively wide range of relative focus uh, with these things. We're also looking for maximum focus. So even with a depth of field scale like this, I would probably want to be a little bit more um, precise. I'd want to shoot a couple more frames at f11 than just one to make sure that I've captured all of the detail from two meters to one meter. If that makes sense. Uh, here's one of those situations where I've got that really strong foreground element and then we've got some stuff in the background I believe I was shooting at 5.6. We can look at the metadata uh, at this later on. But you can see uh, I actually left the very foreground a little bit out of focus, that little sand. But then, uh, shoot, this isn't working as well because I don't have a, a cursor that I can use. Right about here to maybe right about here is in focus in that first frame. And as we run through each frame, so here's the first one. Here's the second. You can see the little branches in focus. Here's the third, fourth and fifth, where that bush back in the background is totally in focus. So what we're going to then do is merge all of these together, and you can actually see, again, here's that first frame where the background's totally out, and the last frame where the foreground or the background is totally in focus. Um, and again, not every image is, is going to look best this way. This kind of looks interesting with that background out of focus, but at the same time, it's not interesting because to me that's a strange green blob back there. So I would want to make sure that I did have that in focus so that we had those sort of competing elements almost. Uh, now, we're going to jump into the post-processing. So I want to open up a, a few images that have sort of common artifacts. Uh, we're going to take a look at doing post-processing, actually taking our exposure series, if you will. And, and one could think of it in the same way of taking an exposure series for high dynamic range exposures. The difference is that we're going for focus, not necessarily, uh, you know, tonal values, not necessarily uh, to capture the full range of, of tones um, like we would with an HDR. And, and that also, and I don't want to say limits what we can do, but um, if you're shooting a scene that has a wider dynamic range than um, a single frame, it's much more difficult to do focus stacking because you have to then shoot an exposure series for the HDR and then an exposure series for the focus stacking, which, which gets to be overkill in most situations. But you can do it. could be fun. I would, uh, I'd love to see people uh, trying that out. Now, 
Uh, what you're seeing on the right is the back of one of my 4x5 cameras. Uh, and what I like about it is that it really shows you uh, the depth of field that you get. And, and this is, of course, with 4x5, so it's an old film camera. Uh, but if we look at this at, uh, let's say, 90 millimeters, which is equivalent to about a 24 or 28 millimeter lens on a uh, standard 35 millimeter, um, if we go to something like f8, at four in you know four feet one inch, we only have about a foot and a half, with, you know, to six foot six of of stuff that's in focus. So you know it's a, it's a very short range of things that are actually in focus, um, and and that's sort of one of the things I want you to keep in mind as we open up some of these exposures. Uh, now, before we get into Photoshop and actually create our um, our focused stacked image. I want to show you two images uh, and some artifacting that, that I've run into, some issues, some stuff that you want to watch out for uh, when, when doing focus stacking. And we'll see what order these images even open up on. Apparently my Photoshop is opening on a different screen that doesn't exist because I'm only on my laptop. <laughs> you can see my Nick software palette opened up perfectly, but my Photoshop is on a different screen. <laughs> And apparently these are huge files. So are there any questions right now as those open up? Does, does Myron uh, know you've got his camera? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Myron, Myron Deghart, uh, is, he's a good buddy of my father's. He was uh, an engineer in the 40s and 50s and 60s, and it was apparently before they had user manuals with photographs. So what he would have to do before he took apart the stuff that he was having to fix is he'd have to take pictures of everything. Uh, he would do that with his 4x5, and he even had an old Corona 65 by 85 camera, which is another view camera, really, really old, um, that he used for that stuff, too. Uh, and I bought the 4x5, 4x5 from him. So he does know I've got it. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully he'd be happy that I'm talking about it as well. It was, his, it was one of his prides and joy. He doesn't shoot anymore, though. Well, he mm -hmm. does. He just doesn't shoot photography. He does trap and skeet. Uh, he's, <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, go ahead, Kevin. No, go ahead. Okay. So we've got, you know, here's a macro shot. And this, for anyone who shoots focus stack macro, you've likely seen this before and you figured out exactly what was going on with it. Um, I actually captured this improperly. But then also this is something that I found will happen with some landscape shots um, is that, you know, A, these lines are terrible. This is, this is um, merged in, in Photoshop, which is a technique that I'm going to show you in a little bit, uh, which is like an auto-merging. And you'll see there's little lines right in here, and they'll show up sort of intermittently in different sections of the photo. There's one right about here as well. You, you can see we've got nice focus from, you know, all the way to the interior of the flower out to the end of the leaves, for the most part, or uh, not leaves, but uh, petals. Um, but I ran into an issue because I wasn't using uh, a bellows, and apparently I wasn't focusing properly uh, when moving in and out, and it created these artifacts uh, in the Photoshop merge. But when I used another piece of software called Helicon Focus, which is another thing that we're going to take a look at, um, it, we didn't have such an issue. I didn't see as many of these artifacts showing up. So this is something to keep track of. You know, and it doesn't always happen in huge bits like this. It might you might have to zoom way in and get a, a good feel for maybe a section in here, uh, you know, an artifact happening like that. But that's something to sort of take heed of. Uh, another thing, and here's that example of uh, image that we were just taking a look at. Here I screwed up completely in that I didn't shoot as many frames as I needed. Right? You can see I've got a little bit out of focus in the foreground, which that's, I was okay with. It's kind of nice to have that little bit. Um, and then, at least I, I felt so in this situation, uh, but then I was nice and in focus here, and then you'll see my relative focus, my sharpness is gone right here, and then right in here, right? You, and I don't know how the resolution is coming through for the, the Hangout on Air, but you can see a pretty dramatic difference between this detail and the fact that this is out of focus because of depth of field, and then as we move our way back, it's back in focus. So optically, it's kind of incorrect, and then also, uh, it just looks weird. Now, you know, there, there might be creative ways of using that, but 
really what happened to me is I just improperly captured this information because I didn't make sure that I had that tack sharp uh, when I was looking at the back of my camera. So that's another thing you have to take note of. And then also remember the closer you focus to your to your camera, right, the closer this object is that I want in focus, uh, the shorter the depth of field is going to be. So it might take you, let's say, eight frames to get from the very foreground right to the middle ground, and then it might only take you two more to get from back here all the way back to infinity. So that's another thing to sort of take note of, and, and that's going to depend upon your lens. This is a 24 to 70. It was set at 70 millimeters, and I didn't shoot enough frames, probably because I was shooting 16 millimeters all day and, and figured I had captured it properly. I didn't. So don't make the same mistake I do, or did. <laughs> All right, so here's the first exposure series, and I, I don't know if that's even the correct term uh, that we should use, and I think this is a good way to start. We're, we're here in Photoshop. There hasn't been much done to this file, some raw processing. I did uh, turn on lens corrections. I got rid of chromatic aberrations. I added a tone curve, and I think I added a little bit of saturation and a little contrast to start. Um, what you're looking at right now is actually the foreground frame. So if I zoom in and move down, you'll notice, you know, from the front of the frame, and I should, I should mention, this isn't my photograph, this is by a good buddy of mine, Kevin Young. Uh, he's a spectacular photographer based here in San Diego. Um, just a, he shoots landscape, architectural stuff, portrait stuff. He, he, he's uh, another RIT grad, knows a lot about shooting, and he's, he's really talented. Um, this frame is actually for the foreground. You can see it's good and tack sharp. I zoomed into 100%. Let me just check something really quick. No, I'm zoomed into 50%. Eh, we probably don't need to go much further than 66. Uh, but as we make our way back, you know, you'll notice nothing in the background is in focus, right? Now, if we had shot this so that um, my background was tack sharp, or Kevin's background was tack sharp, well, then what we're going to run into is that our foreground is, is soft. Right? So in this series, because the distance from the camera, this is strange, there we go. The distance from the camera um, to this area is pretty far, and he's shooting relatively wide, and I couldn't tell you exactly what it is. It, it seemed to have only taken him three frames to capture the, the full range of information in terms of sharpness. So what we're doing here is I went ahead and I took the foreground, I took a, a sort of middle ground frame and a background frame that, that he had photographed. I took them and I layered them together. Now, there's a few ways that you can do that. I'm going to show you, uh, there's a few automated ways, I should say. You can do it manually, but there's, there's a, a couple uh, automatic ways of doing this, which I would suggest because it will auto-align these in, this bits of, of information. And the benefit of that is that as we change the focus, you'll actually see the image change just a little bit because we're moving the lens. So that's another thing you have to sort of take note of. It's okay, uh, especially with these kinds of automated uh, layer alignment bits that you can do. Um, so, so I'll show you that part. I'm actually going to show you that launching from Lightroom um, in the, the whole interface, but there's two ways of doing it that are really simple here in, in Photoshop. Again, I'm going to show you the process itself in a couple minutes. Uh, the first one is, oh, and you know what I did wrong? I didn't turn on all of my layers. So if I want to auto-align all of these layers in my Photoshop um, layers palette, I have to first enable them all. And an enabled layer, for anyone who maybe isn't familiar, is just one that's on. It's, you can see it's highlighted. The rest are, are the other two here are gray. I want all three of them to be, if you will, on. So I'm going to hold the Shift button down on my keyboard, and I'm going to click on my top layer, and this is going to enable all of my layers, right? Because my background layer was enabled or on. Hold Shift, turn on the other ones, um, and now when I go to Image, sorry, Edit, and I go to Auto Align Layers, I can just click on that. And for anyone who maybe does panoramic photography, uh, you might be familiar with with this general interface. Uh, you can just leave this right on Auto and click OK, and it's going to auto align those layers. Uh, the other quick way to do it is to go up to File, Automate, and Photo Merge. And we're going to do that later on from Lightroom. 
Uh, first off, just again to show you this stuff, this is literally just layer masking in layers. So we've auto-aligned the layers using that image auto... Sorry. <laughs> I keep messing it up. It's edit. Auto-align. That aligns them properly. And then I can go in and I can mask each one of these individual layers, which I opted for in this case because it's very simple. That is, I, I could see, you know, the end of my foreground object is right here. So if we look at our, or, oops, our foreground, <laughs> click it around too quickly. Here's the, the foreground mask, right, because there's a delineated edge of where my foreground ends. So I'm able to just go ahead and mask that right off, and that's my foreground. My middle ground looks like this. Actually, that needs to be cleaned. Apparently, I never even looked at it before. Uh, oops. So this is an artifact that occurs when you use uh, the, which, which one is it, the quick select. So I messed up using the quick select in making my selection. Um, and this is what's happened. It's created this line back here. And then what happens in our pixels is that uh, this is actually included. So apparently, whatever that line is, that's included from my foreground um, layer, which is probably OK at that point, because it's, it's towards the rear of the, of the frame. Um, but anyways, again, what you're doing here is literally just using a layer mask to put these together. It's simple if you're familiar with layer masking, but it's a lot of work. So I'm going to close that, and we're going to take a look at and actually do an example of, um, of a merge. We're going to do two of them, actually. So let me open up my Lightroom. And we're here in Lightroom. Are there any questions, Kevin, or anyone? Are we well, still good to um, <laughs> we do have one question, but I'm, you might be getting to it. Uh, which software application do you consider the best at focus stacking? Would I be better? off buying a dedicated software as opposed to Photoshop CC? Great question. Uh, what I've found is that the proprietary pieces of software, uh, you know, the ones that are designed specifically for this, uh, are doing or do do a better job, uh, in my mind, than what, uh, what Photoshop is able to do. Now, I, I want to point out that it could be that I'm not necessarily capturing the perfect way that Photoshop exp you know, wants me to. But that said, uh, when I put into Helicon Focus, which I'm going to show you in a couple minutes, um, it, it does do a better job uh, most of the time to, to make sure everything is good and sharp and in focus. So I do suggest uh, those proprietary tools. There's a few out there that are really nice. We're only going to be able to take a look at one of those uh, this evening that I found I, I like quite a bit, both for the quality and the ease of use uh, of the interface itself. Great cool. question. All right, great. All right. So working from Lightroom, uh, these are TIFF files right now, but they might as well just be RAW files. Uh, they're TIFF files because th this was an exposure series that I sort of experimented with with all of the pieces of software that I was using. Uh, so I've, I've just left them in TIFF, and that also makes it a little faster if I'm going to open them into Photoshop right now because it doesn't have to generate a new one. Uh, now, that said, let's just, and I don't, it might take a little too long to zoom in, but this exposure, I believe, is for my foreground, if I remember correctly, and I'm pretty sure it's a full 36, me nope, this is for the background. <laughs> uh, it's a full 36 megapixels, but you can see there's no detail down here, right? Now, there's probably great detail back in that background, um, and we've, we've established that, and I probably don't need to, to beat it to death, but uh, again, we're just making sure that we have full information. This is the background. Here's the foreground frame. You can already see it hasn't even rendered, but it's still soft focus back here. Uh, the process, after you've done whatever raw processing you might want to do, uh, and synchronize that across the board with all of the images that you're looking to merge, uh, what you'll do is you'll enable all of the images, which is actually the same as what we did with Photoshop. That is, you'll click on either the right-hand side image or the left-hand side image, hold shift, click on the opposite end of the exposure series, and this enables those images. And then uh, I tend to just right-click, so that's control-click on a Mac or uh, command. Is it uh, control-click on a Mac, command-click on a PC, if I remember correctly. And what we're going to do is go to Edit In, 
and then simply, uh, well, there's two ways to do it. We can either open as layers in Photoshop or merge to panorama in Photoshop. Now, if I open as layers, I have to do one more step in Photoshop than if I just simply merge to panorama. So in this situation, or, or when doing focus stacking like this, um, if we're launching from Lightroom, I would generally suggest clicking Merge to Panorama in Photoshop. This is going to take a second because those are huge files. I'm not going to run through the whole thing, hopefully, uh, because I've got a pre-baked version of this. Uh, let's see what happens. Apparently it is going to do it. It didn't ask me the question that I expected it to. Probably because they're TIFF files. So that's going to take an hour. Oh, nope, there it is. So uh, there's my Photo Merge option. Again, anybody who's familiar with or does pano imagery from Photoshop, this is the same interface. Uh, what you're going to do for focus stacking is leave it right on auto. You're going to leave, uh, you know, whatever images that you want in there. So in this case, I've, I've simply highlighted them in, in uh, Lightroom, so they're all in there. What's important, though, when doing focus stacking is that we don't want to blend the images together. So you want to turn that off. Uh, I already used lens corrections in my raw processing, so I don't need the vignette removal in this case, and I don't need ge geometric distortion correction. So what you'll do is just click OK. And then what's going to happen is all of those images, they're going to open up into Photoshop, and they're going to be stacked together in layers. And I've already sort of pre-baked one, so it doesn't take so long to make. So I'm going to edit this one in Photoshop. The, the image that we're opening is simply the uh, resulting image from what would happen from the process that we just sort of did. So this will take a second because it's still a big file, but it's not nearly as long as if we were to do it again. All right. Now let's see if I missed anything. I had a, a couple notes on the side here. I think we've pretty much covered all of the sort of technical things of shooting. Um, you know, your, your lens, if you're shooting with a... Um, a 300 millimeter lens, you might find that f11, depending upon you know what wide open is with that particular lens, you might find that f11 is the sharpest. Uh, what tends to happen is it's going to be generally around f8 uh, or you know 5.6 f8 or f11 is going to be that sort of optimum. But it is going to be dependent upon your lens, and you, you might want to sort of uh, experiment a look a little bit. And uh, again, the general rule is just two stops up from wide open. So that is closing down two stops. Sort of a strange thing to say. Uh, now, our resulting image would look like this. So that would be when we did our, our photo merge. And really all it's doing is aligning those layers for us. Nice and simple. Now what we've got to do oops, is I need to enable all of those layers. So again, right now I'm clicked on the top layer. So I'm going to hold Shift and just click on the bottom layer. It's going to enable all of those for us. We go up to uh, Image. Let's see, I always forget. It's actually Edit. And this time, we go to Auto Blend. Because with Auto Blend layers, we're going to have two capabilities. There is, for some reason, another Panorama Blend method. I don't know why it's in here as well. Uh, I'm not sure of the differences. There must be some kind of difference between using Photo Merge or this. Uh, but what we want to do is stack images. And then all you literally do is click OK. And then in, what's going to happen is the software goes and looks for high frequency details, uh, among other things, and it tries to give us uh, the most in-focus stuff it can <laughs> for a, a semi-technical explanation of what's happening right now. Uh, and, and what's going to happen in a second, once this is all done, is that we're going to have layer masks and it's going to associate all of those high frequency, all those good, very detailed areas from each individual layer. So once that's done, and you know, again, this is a, a little bit of a process, and for demonstration purposes, I usually wouldn't use a full 36 megapixel frame, but because it's pertaining to being in focus and out of focus, I thought it was important uh, to sort of really get that good high quality. Um, I'll add as this works, if, if you only put images up on the internet at 2,000 pixels, generally you won't have to even worry about this process. Because if we take a full resolution file from a, from a digital SLR 
camera, and we res it down to to if we make it smaller to be about 2,000 pixels or so, um, your relative focus is increased. That is, the details that maybe were out of focus back here in the background, when we res it down, it'll look more in focus. So, you know, when we get into all of this, it's, it's more about, um, you know, maybe a creative use. It is more about folks who might want to make prints. Uh, whether they be huge prints, which this will allow us to do and have everything in focus, or maybe even smaller prints, but to be able to kind of retain uh, the ultimate sharpness and quality that we could get from, from our camera. Uh, now that that's sort of filled out, you can see our layer masks, and it's literally just finding the best detail it possibly can as I click on the wrong button. And so from this layer, apparently it's background and seemingly a little bit from the foreground. I say we zoom in and see what's happening down in here because that doesn't seem right to me. It seems incorrect. Uh, but as we click through the different layers, you know, this is the information that's being used. Sorry, I should mention anything in white is the information that's being used from this particular layer. So actually I think we can turn all of these other ones off. So this is all of the information that that one frame is even giving us. So it goes from a full 36 megapixels of image, uh, you know, of, of information, and we're really only using that bit. Or if we look at this one, it's even thinner. So it's even smaller bit of information. Let's turn all of these images or all these frames on, and I'm going to zoom in because I think we're going to have a problem down here in the foreground. Yeah, we definitely do. So this is when we're merging in Photoshop, um, and and look down here. Which layer is it? It's uh, this layer right here. So for some reason, the software thinks that this is going to be the most in focus stuff. That's not the case. So what we're going to have to do, let's see here if we can even do this. I think we're going to have to mask this out. So it basically we can clean this up. So I can hit brush. I should be able to brush that out. And then I should be able to go back into this layer and basically brush it back in. Although, let's see if it even works, because it might not work here. Oh, I'm at 30% opacity. So there. <laughs> so this way, you can kind of go in and retouch um, if you need to. Again, you're just literally using layer masks uh, when merging in Photoshop. So the benefit of this is that you have um, a relatively easy way to do creative in focusing, if you will, or out of focusing. Because I could theoretically, let's say we wanted this whole thing out of focus, we could brush this area black in a layer mask, so I could get rid of it, and pardon the terrible masking, but we could do this. And this is for creative purposes. We could then go into um, our bottom frame, which is the background, and we could paint this all in. So now we've got stuff that's out of focus. Uh, and I mean to point this out because maybe there's situations where I really want something to be out of focus, right? By merging this stuff in Photoshop, I can easily use those layer masking uh, controls to, to, to make the things in focus or make the things out of focus, depending upon what we're going for. That's method number two, and that's using Photo Merge from Lightroom and Photoshop. It's pretty amazing so, how uh, automated Photoshop can make things, isn't it? Oh, it's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> even even the auto-align layers is really handy um, in certain situations for, for just making sure the edges of things line up and so on. Uh, it's quite nice. So here's another exposure series. I'm going to open them into Helicon Focus. So let's actually I'll open up Helicon Focus so you can see the interface first. All we really have to do is drag these files. This is a wonderfully simple piece of software. Um, and at the default settings, it usually does pretty much a perfect job. Um, but what you'll do is you'll open up the software, and I can literally just go into my, you know, my Finder. I, I believe there's a way of setting it up so if you're a Lightroom user, you can send images from Lightroom directly into Helicon Focus. But um, I haven't figured out how to do it. I haven't really uh, explored that option. But I believe you can do that. Somebody told me they could. So... I'm just going to open from my finder. We'll just drag them into the interface. This is going to take a second, uh, but it's going to load all of those files in the upper right-hand corner. And as that happens, just as a brief overview of this interface, 
Uh, you've got a couple options in the upper left hand corner for viewing. Uh, you can register online because I'm using a 30 day free trial. So this is very cool. You can go out and shoot a couple of these exposure series and then download Helicon Focus for a 30 day free trial. Um, and, and right now we're in the rendering module. It's already finished rendering, so I, I'll sort of skip the interface part. Um, and we're going to go into retouching and then saving the file. We, I'll show you text and scale very briefly, but so we don't run out of time. Let's do this. Uh, you've got all of your files over here on the right. And I've got rendering methods on the right-hand side as well. Each of these rendering methods uh, basically does this focus stacking using different algorithms. Uh, the one that they leave as their default setting and the one in my experimentation that has worked best for me um, has been the, the depth map. Um, there are probably situations where weight average and pyramid work differently and better. I don't know if it's necessarily for macro or for landscape. Um, I couldn't find those situations, but at the same time, um, there's, there's folks that have been doing this and using this piece of software for years and years and years, uh, where I find that the depth map does it perfectly for me, so I haven't had to experiment too much. Um, so I stick with method B. I leave my resolution on full because I want my full, you know, uh, on my entire bit of megapixels, the reason why I've got my camera. Um, and then my radius and smoothening, these actually you can leave at default most of the time as well. Uh, and you literally just hit render. So you open the files, you hit render. It does uh, basically this, this depth map, which you're going to see on the right-hand side. Uh, what it's going to do is kind of figure out those high-frequency details and where each bit of information uh, should be coming from in each frame. And it's not showing up for... Oh, there we go. It's kind of interesting to watch it work because it'll, you get this weird sort of masking thing that shows up there, as you can see that on the right-hand side. As soon as that finishes, uh, I'll show you an artifact that occurred because of the palm trees in the background moving. And also, you can see there's people uh, that are walking through the frames. So I'll show you how to take care of those right inside Helicon Focus um, using the retouching section of the interface. Hey, how are we doing on time, guys? Uh, we got about uh, three to five minutes. Perfect. Okay. So this should run and should be finished in another 15 seconds. I think I... I got, a, I got a question for you real quick. Sure. Okay, so you mentioned that you move the lens while shooting for stocking. Do you reposition the lens or do you only adjust the focus to different areas of the location? So I think they maybe misunderstood um, when yep, you said I, your lens I was probably, in a position. I uh, probably didn't word it in the, the best of ways. Um, you definitely don't want to change the zoom. Uh, you know, if you're using a zoom lens, you want to keep that, you know, the, the actual millimeter, the magnification, um, where it was initially. You want to change the focusing ring. So you are going to manually go in and focus, or, uh, you know, you can use autofocus, but you have to change the point, your focus point, to a different section of the frame. So uh, what, what I tend to do when I'm shooting is I'll use... Um, shoot, as I, <laughs> as the, the name of it escapes me. So uh, the, the live view, <laughs> I'll turn live view on, and I'll go in and I'll focus on the very closest thing to start, and then it'll take the picture, so live view will turn off for a second, and it'll turn back on, telling me that it's ready to go again. I'll zoom in to, you know, the next area, so maybe right about here, and I'll focus there, and then, it, and I think this was nine frames altogether here, uh, but yeah, you don't want to change the, the zoom ring. You want to change uh, the focus point. Um, I tend to do it manually. You can do it, um, you know, using autofocus, especially with a lot of the new live views. Good and question. What, maybe one other tip would be uh, if you are going to use the manual focus lens, um, if you if you have a somewhat loose zoom ring, you might just want to tape it down because you, you absolutely don't want that to move. That's a great, great point. Yeah, uh, you don't want that to move at all. So, um, Dan, Dan, one one question is, as long as we're on this subject, I understand for this type of shot here, you, you need to change your your focus position. But I seem to recall the people that do macro work, they actually put it on a rail and physically move the camera closer or further away. Yeah. Um, what are the pros and cons for the 
the two techniques, at least for macro, where it perhaps is, is practical. Well, so you, you wouldn't necessarily use a bellows system for landscape. Um, you know, for, for macro, you put it on a rail, you know, for micro adjustments. And there's there's two different, there's actually a whole bunch of different setups. I shouldn't say two. But there's there's three general things that you could theoretically do with macro. You could use a fixed macro lens that's on your camera where you're just changing the focus point, right, which is okay. Then there's rail setup where you basically are moving the whole camera with the lens. And mm -hmm. then there's a third setup generally, and there might even be more than this that I'm maybe just not aware of, but uh, there's, there's a third setup with a bellows system where what you would do is you'd have your lens at a particular point. You don't move the lens. You move the back of the camera. So, so right. you've got a, and I wish I had an example here, but you'd have a camera, you know, right here. You'd have bellows in between uh, the camera and the lens, and then you'd be moving the back of the camera forward and backward so that the the point in front of the lens isn't changing. And and there's a term that I can't remember um, that is a, it's a focusing point. It's right in front of the lens, and there's one right behind the lens. It's not nodal point, but uh, because that's pertaining to panoramic, but um, yeah. So the best way generally for macro is to use a bellows-based system okay. where you're moving the back of the camera in most situations. Good comment. Great, thank you. Um, now, so what I've done is we went from the rendering section of Helicon Focus to the retouching section of Helicon Focus. And uh, what this is going to allow us to do is fix any uh, issues that might occur, like ghosting. And this would be it probably looks very similar to uh, anybody that does any sort of uh, HDR photography, except this is jumping around right now. There we go. Where, you know, you can see a ghost, right? You see the people right there showing up. And they're showing up because in one of the frames, they're standing there. And I don't know which frame it is, but what I can do is I can go and find a frame in my stack on the right-hand side here and say, okay, well, in uh, DAH1003.tiff, it's really sharp back here, and there's no people. So I will use that frame. You can see it's highlighted. And then I'll just go over the image itself. So this on the right-hand side is our stock, or sorry, our stacked image. On the left-hand side, that's going to be the original image, the non-stacked version. So you need to pick this version, this frame, based upon what you want in focus, uh, and also what you don't want that artifacting in. So you literally just have to go over the artifact click and it'll get rid of it for you, right? Because what it's doing is, is then taking this information and it's putting it in our final frame. Uh, the first time I did this with Helicon Focus, I noticed a lot of those people moving, but I didn't notice uh, a lot of these palms moving. And it was very windy, so you think I should have, but you can, you can even notice now that it looks pretty terrible. So I'm going to go in with my retouching. And again, since this is the background, and we've established that DAH1003 is good and sharp in the background, uh, then we can use that frame uh, to get rid of these sorts of issues. So I'll go ahead and do that over here. And then make sure I, I don't have any of the issue over uh, in the rest of my palm. But this will happen. You know, just like when shooting HDR, because things are moving in the, in the frame, uh, we'll want to do that, get, or do this retouching. Now, the beauty of this is that it's all in this interface. Uh, I don't know of an HDR piece of software that has this all-in-one interface where you can go in with a brush and say, okay, from this exposure, I want this information. Uh, now, it's likely because it's different um, in terms of the information and how it's being gathered and the, the tonal ranges, but uh, at the same time, this is really handy and really quite simple, and you've got other options as well, brush size, brightness, color tolerance, and so on and so forth. Uh, for the sake of time... I'm just going to go ahead and zoom back out. We've got our in-focus image. I'm going to click Save on the right-hand side, and then you've got all these different save options. Uh, you can even export 3D models out of Helicon Focus uh, when, when doing focus stacking. Uh, that's a bit different. I would imagine even capturing is different. I've never done that, but it sounds really cool. <laughs> but you'll just save your image, and then you can open it up into you know, your Lightroom catalog or, or into Photoshop and kind of go from there. Uh, because all this is doing is after your raw processing, it's allowing you to do this focus stacking. I would still suggest if you want to do any sort of toning uh, or any sort of you know retouching, other than just getting rid of those artifacts, uh, open it back up into Photoshop and, 
and do that work. But, Dan, uh, what's the uh, cost on this software? That's a wonderful question. <laughs> it's a 30-day free trial. I have it actually open. Oh, that's not the right screen. Uh, that's Vanguard. I have to send my tripod back in because uh, one of the legs is messed up. But I'll send you guys the link. It's, it's literally helicon-focused software, or heliconsoft.com, <laughs> um, and you can find the website. I don't, I've forgotten the cost of it, uh, but if we click on it right now, uh, maybe it'll tell us. And maybe it won't because we have to maybe add it to a... I think they have several pricing plans from what I remember. Yeah. Oh. So I'm not sure, but that one's not hard to, to figure out. Okay, I'll switch back. Well, maybe we okay. can put that link in our show notes then so people can go sure. shopping. Absolutely. Yeah. This, this, oh, and actually uh, you're seeing me again, but I have another um, website for you guys to check out. It's, it's called dofmaster.com, depthoffieldmaster.com, D-O-F. Um, and there's some there's depth of field calculators, and that's the same company that has the uh, uh, the app for your for your iPhone or your Android devices. It's really quite handy. Cool. Cool. Awesome. That's good information. Um, you know, and especially you know, I think a lot of us now, especially now that uh, Adobe's got that program where you can get Lightroom and Photoshop for ten dollars a month. Yeah. You know, it opens Photoshop up to a lot more people and just with that tool there's quite a bit you can do with that and that just shows another thing. Obviously I think the the uh, Helicon program would be ideal, but if you if you just want to do it occasionally then you know yeah. what there's nothing wrong with the uh, Photoshop for sure. Absolutely. That's great. All right, well uh, Appreciate that, and now let's go over to uh, Jim and let's do our uh, recommended photographers. Yeah, let me share my screen, and, and I just want to say, Dan, that was great, and, awesome. and next time I'd like to see focus stacking with an HDR image uh, <laughs> on a 4 by 6 pano. Yeah, 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 there yeah. That would be crazy. <laughs> I'll try and figure that one out. <laughs> Indeed. All right, no, great, great... Uh, presentation. So my recommended photographer is Jeremy Tice and uh, he's a Wyoming based photographer, uh, self-taught and uh, he says he specializes in landscapes and you know looking at his stream I'm inclined to believe him. I, I, this one's gorgeous. This is from Wyoming. Um, just a you know, beautiful color, um, you know, composition, strong foreground, very nice. Um, and uh, here's kind of an iconic um, Sonoran Desert shot uh, taken down outside of Tucson, but, you know, just, just beautiful work. Um, and uh, most of what's in his stream are landscape shots from the western U.S. So, um, uh, oh, and, and also I, I saw a note that, uh, and Kevin will appreciate this, he, most of his work is... Uh, Shot later in the day. He does not like getting up early in the morning. <laughs> yeah, the same person over there. That's yep. beautiful. Yep. So uh, go take a look. He'll be in the show notes, and uh, I encourage you to follow him. And uh, so let's see. Next, uh, Dan, your choice. Oh sure. So this is uh, Adam Allegro, who's a, he's a travel photographer. Um, he was, he, and I, I mentioned this to the to the panelists here earlier. I'm not sure which um, which branch of the military he was in, but he was uh, he was a military guy. Started traveling with the military, started shooting, uh, you know, photographing. Uh, he started to love it so much that he decided when he got out that this is what he's going to do professionally, and that's what he's been doing ever since, and doing it you know very nicely as well. He's a, he's a great guy. Um, and he's got some really interesting, beautiful work from around the world. Oh, wow. This is Bromo, I think. Gorgeous color. Yeah. Yeah, imagine being there at the time. It's incredible. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. Next up, Margaret. Uh, this is Carolyn Lim. Uh, she's one of our amazingly talented um, landscape curators. And uh, she lives in Singapore and does some wonderful 
um, work where you see these beautiful reflections and lights at night. Uh, and this is the Singapore uh, skyline there uh, that you see. So just incredible work. And then she also does some uh, wonderful uh, landscapes. Uh, this is near Sedona. Uh, I just love the red rocks and the greenery there. Uh, the soft water, just a beautiful, beautiful landscape uh, photograph there. Uh, amazingly talented and does beautiful work. Uh, excellent photographer. We're very lucky to have her as a curator. And uh, so she's the one I'm recommending this evening. Okay, thank you. And let's see, Tom. <laughs> Tom, you're muted. <laughs> thank you. Thank there you. you. I picked a photographer from Chicago, Illinois, um, Christoph Hanusiak. Now, I, I particularly like this shot of the pier, of the, uh, the tones and the soft water movement, and how the, uh, the piling seem to just walk, continue out into the, uh, into the uh, water. Um, so I thought this was a good shot. He also does uh, some architectural pictures, and he also does some street photography. Um, this happens to be one of his architectural pictures, just the pattern of the building. and yeah. uh, It happens to be in black and white again, but he also does color work. And um, I've enjoyed looking at his stream and would encourage other people to give him a shout as well. Beautiful. Repetition. That's amazing. I love the geometry there. That just... Yeah, it's, it's great, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Tom. And uh, now back to Kevin. Yeah, so this is Carrie Cole, and uh, she is out of, uh, let's see, Victoria, British Columbia. And so she, I'm sure she has plenty of uh, awesome stuff to shoot like this. And I think she's uh, fairly new to Google+, Plus, uh, or at least she's fairly new to sharing with us. So um, really great stuff there. Uh, go ahead and go to the next one. And... Uh, you know, as you can see there, she's got some nice soft water with the the uh, motion in the uh, in the whirlpool there, kind of, and just gorgeous photos. So uh, follow Carrie, and you'll enjoy it. I love that. That's gorgeous. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jim. Okay. Well, we appreciate everyone that. Uh, joined us tonight and if you have any questions um, feel free to post them um, to the show page we'll have some show notes up uh, at some point with the links to the software and uh, you know if you have any questions feel free to ask them there and we'll try and get them answered um, our next show is April 8th with Ray Billcliff so that's gonna be another exciting show it'll be our second time with uh, Ray and if you didn't catch the first one you can always go back and watch it uh, on the YouTube channel and uh, he's great he gets up at like 2 in the morning to uh, his time to to do our show with us so he's uh, and he's so excited about it so it'll be a great show so mark your calendar for that and uh, with that we'll say good night Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.